A lot of NASCAR fans remember the time when NASCAR went overseas and raced at Japan three times, racing at Suzuka from 1996 and 1997, and the Motoki Ovo in 1998. NASCAR had raced at Montreal from 2007 through 2012 for the NASCAR Bush and Nationwide Series. Also, they raced at Mexico before. Trucks raced at Canadian Tire Motorsports Park from 2013 through 2019. As of the making of this video, trucks have not made a start at most sport in 2020 or we don't know about this year due to covid and yes there are other nascar series outside of the u.s such as the nascar Pinty series the nascar euro series nascar mexico series and so on however not a lot of fans either remember or talk about the time when nascar raced at australia in 1988 that is right folks the nascar winston cup series went to caldo park raceway however it was named thunderdome in this episode, we are going to talk about NASCAR's very first race outside of the US. Here's the 17th edition of Racing Stories. Here is NASCAR in Australia, the 1988 Goodyear NASCAR 500 at Thunderdome. The 1988 Goodyear NASCAR 500 was the very first NASCAR race ran outside of the US, very first international race. And the Thunderdome Raceway itself was the very first NASCAR style high banked oval built outside of the US as well. The track itself. The Calder Park Thunderdome was built by former racer and Australian multi-millionaire tire retailer Bob Jane, who also owned the Calder Park Road Circuit at a cost of 54 million Australian dollars. The Thunderdome was the 1.119 mile quad oval track and is a scaled down version of the Charlotte Motor Speedway. With the same 24 degree banking in the turns, despite it being a quad oval, it was generally referred to it as a tri oval. NASCAR would generally lap the touch over 140 miles per hour on a high banked oval, making it, as of 2018, the fastest purpose built racetrack in Australia and the fastest overall, including street circuits used for Formula One and IndyCar. Goodyear being not only the same race sponsor, but also the naming rights sponsor of the track itself was the only tire supplier so American teams like Raymock who used Hoosier tires in the 1988 Winston Cup Series had to run Goodyear tires in Australia. Calder Park has hosted events ranging from Australian touring cars, historic super touriers, super trucks and super bikes to rock concerts featuring the world class artists such as Fleetwood Mac, Santana and Guns N' Roses. There's your brief history about Thunderdome, now let's talk about the story about this race. On the 28th of February 1988, the 1988 Goodyear NASCAR 500 was held two weeks after the 1988 Daytona 500 in the Richmond race. 46,000 race fans on the other side of the globe attended the race. Richmond winner Neil Bonnet started on the pole with the speed of 139.734 miles per hour. There were some other notable NASCAR Winston Cup Series racing at the Thunderdome, such as Neil Bonnet, Bobby Allison, Dave Marcus, Kyle Petty, and Michael Waltrip. Other notable drivers such as Herschel McGriff and Bill Venturini also attended the race. 32 drivers started the race, 23 Americans, 8 Australians, and 1 Canadian, which is Jerry Churchill, attended the race. Here's a starting lineup for the race. Friday's top 10 showed Neil Bonnet with quick time in the Valvoline Pontiac over Bobby Allison with Ozzy Allen Grice third. Fourth quick was Chad Little, fifth Californian Ron Esau, then Australian Robin Bess from Bob Howard, Dave Marcus, Glenn Stewart, and Gary Collins. So, I could not find the rest of the starting grid for that race, so good luck with that. I mean good luck finding the rest of the starting grid, not the top 10 only. Sorry about that, folks. The race was broadcasted on ESPN in the US, which was simulcast on the 7 Network coverage. The commentators for the race were Mike Raymond, Gary Wilkinson, and Neil Crompton. Christy Konamaki was doing pit road reporting alongside with Australian motor racing driver Peter McKay. Fun fact, Chris Economaki covered some Bathurst 1000 races from the late 70s and the early 80s. Gentlemen, start your engines. So the field is set, the command was given. Now let's go NASCAR Australian Racing. Under the control of Bill Gazaway of NASCAR, the field comes down for the start. It'll be a slow one, obviously, and it's Bonnet on the inside, and Bonnet will get the jump. Bonnet is away. 
Bobby Allison trails. Alan Grice did not miss the start. He moves up very quickly on them. And Robin Best, in fact, was very, very slow to get away. Bonnet will lead them through turn number one, through two now, working the back straight, clear of Bobby Allison. Alan Grice starting to pick them up as they head down there. Robin Best is the next one to go through. Sosby also well positioned. So too is Brad Knopfsinger. Bonnet led from the start with Alan Grice passing Bobby Allison coming out of turn number two to move into second on lap two. The Aussie then sat out after Neil Bonnet with Bobby Allison in hot pursuit was looking likely to challenge the Pontiac number 75 but came off second best in a touch with Bobby Allison's Buick coming off a of turn number 4 which brought out the race's first caution after just 13 laps after Grice's Oldsmobile was sent spinning across the infield. Allison in the number 12 Buick, Alan Grice in the number 03 Foster's Oldsmobile, there's our race cam shot, Allison poking the nose now of the Buick down on the inside of the Oldsmobile and oh. a touch then! A touch, and there is gone. Bobby Allison has it. Grice, Grice, Grice is field. gone. He's got a, a park, and he's skidding sideways across the infield. The crowd has gone absolutely crazy in front of the commentary box. Grice has managed to survive, but pointing the wrong way. Yellow flag is out. While Grice had over 20 years of motor racing experience, his NASCAR experience was limited compared to Bobby Allison's, who at that time was a 27-year veteran of the sport with some 700 race starts and 84 Winston Cup Series wins after Richmond. So it was no surprise to see the American come through without a drama. For Grice, it sent him to the rear of the field for the restart, and over the next 50 laps or so, his charge back through the field also saw the brakes go away on his automobile. After the first caution came out, I'm not sure this is like the second caution or whatever, but number 26 of Terry Byer spun in turn number two which brought out another yellow. There's the blue smoke, Terry Byers. In the Tui's entry from Wollongong, the Southern Thunder car. And boy, that is lighting up your Goodyear Eagles. <laughs> Between turns one and two, Terry Byers. And back up the bank it goes. The field comes by. Michael Waltrip had the inglorious honor being the first to call into the pits outside of a NASCAR US race at the end of the first lap for new tires after a tap from behind had sent him into a half spin from which he quickly recovered. The tap also saw damage to the rear of Waltrip's Monte Carlo. The race was marred by a multi-car crash at around lap 80 in turns 3 and 4 involving 8 cars, including the Ford Thunderbird of Dick Johnson and Alan Grice, who, after struggling with no brakes in his charge through the field, ran into the wreck at speed, heavily damaging both and Johnson's car in the process as it was the number 17 Thunderbird that he hit. Oh, and we've got another car really, and oh. in fact, we've got three, four, five wrecks up on turn number three. And it's a real schmozzle, including Dick Johnson, yeah, whose Johnson. car is on fire. Alan Grice piles to the middle of the pack, written his car off as well. We've got three, four, five cars there. In six. fact, six. Yep, six cars, including Grice, including Johnson. It's hard at this moment. Johnson's to car the is others. a complete wreck. So is Alan Grice. Goodness me, I didn't pick the car that set that off. I just looked up, caught it from the corner of my eye. There's Dick Johnson climbing out of his car. That's two in a week. Well, he'd almost come to a dead stop in the center of the track when Grice speared through the turn and slammed straight into the side of him. How he didn't hit one of those other cars before he hit Johnson, I'll never know. I wonder whether we have anything on race cam of that incident. It'll be pretty spectacular. Bill Venturini having his second uh, prank. Let's have a look at our Goodyear replay of just exactly what happened. Turn number three we're looking at is that David Susby. Oh no, this has happened further up the track. Bill Venturini's in there somewhere. It's the 14 car that triggered all of that off. Harry Gallard. Lap number 81 of 280. Alan Grice goes in at about 150 mile an hour. Slams into Dick Johnson. Still can't pick up all the players in this. Six cars in total. Alan Grice suffered a broken collarbone as a result of the high-speed accident while both his and Johnson's cars were heavily damaged. The race had mixed the debris cautions and incident yellows. This caution that you're about to see is another caution for a spin from the 89 of Bob Howard. Bob Howard and the Pennzoil car coming back into the pits and the reason he is heading into the pits is what you're about to see on the Goodyear recap. Wham, slam, straight off the wall around sideways and back down across the infield into the grass area. Not too much uh, in the way of space between there and the concrete wall. So Bob Howard has had a big hit and that has brought out the yellow flag. 
And speaking of debris cautions, there was yet another debris caution, but this time for the number 30 of Michael Waltrip. A yellow flag caution period. Uh, Bobby Allison has gone to the pits at the same time. They're changing tyres on the right-hand side. That's the working side. Let's have a look at uh, what the reason was. Aha, Michael Waltrip in car number 30, heading on down the back straight. Whoop, there goes the rear bumper. That's the reason the yellow flag has come out. After a pretty good, cool, and awesome experience and historical moment in NASCAR history, the race went down between the Alabama gangs of Neil Bonnet and Bobby Allison coming into the white flag. We're waiting for the white flag. It's coming out. The Goodyear 500 comes down to the last lap, and we have Bobby Allison closing on race leader Neil Bonnet as they head off the trioval down into turn number one. Half a second, 0.56 separating them as they make the run down the back straight for the last time. They've got cars to uh, wind in and out of before they reach turn number three. Neil Bonner driving for the Raymock Valvoline team, halfway using the low side of the circuit. The team is ready to jump, turn four out, down through the trioval. The chequered flag is at the ready, and Neil Bonner and the Valvoline Pontiac strikes gold. Second place will go to Bobby Allison in the number 12 Buick, and third place is Dave Marcus in the number 71 car. What a waste, what a drive from Neil Bonnet. The fastest man at Thunderdome. Neil Bonnet won the race by less than a second from a fast closing Bobby Allison who benefited from a late race yellow flag pit stop which allowed him to change all four of his tires without losing a lap. The Alabama gang members dominated the race with Dave Marcus finishing third giving the USA a 1-2-3 result. The Alabama Trio finished two laps ahead of fourth place finisher Glenn Stourer who was driving a Monte Carlo. In fact, the top 10 finishers were American, proving that experience in this form of racing was paramount. The first Australian to finish was the Monte Carlo Robin Best who finished 13 laps down in 11th place. Only 15 of the 32 cars finished the race. Neil Bonnet's win earned him 59,000 Australian dollars which means $42,000 in the U.S. The race lasted 3 hours, 23 minutes, and 45 seconds. The average speed was 101.167 miles per hour. The race had 11 cautions for 52 laps and 24 lead changes. Also, a fun fact, according to Slap Shoes and his Another Top 10 NASCAR Records That Will Never Be Broken video, spoilers, on number 3, Neil Bonnet traveled 24,000 miles and won 3 races in a row at Richmond, Thunderdome, and Rockingham. What a legend. Shout out to Neil Bonnet for being a legend in those three races. After the 1988 Goodyear NASCAR 500, NASCAR did come back to Thunderdome three more times for the 1988 and 1990 Christmas 500 and the 1994 USA versus Australia 200. After those races, the Thunderdome had a downfall of a story. And I'm going to let my good friend NASCAR Nick 2488 take over this part. So Nick, take it away. In 2001, Oscar went out of business, and the Thunderdome Oval track closed down due to financial issues. The story behind the closing of the Thunderdome Oval was ugly. According to Racing Circuits, Family Feud gets ugly. The story said, and I quote, Worse was to come when financial worried reared their head at Bob Jane's companies with the suggestion that the team arts business had been propping up the racing circuits. For numerous years, a situation which had become untenable. Bob's son Rodney, who was also a racer, was tasked with turning around the business, in return gaining full ownership of the company his father had founded. This would eventually lead to a family feud when Jane Jr. realized that the profligacy towards the tracks would have to end. A hugely acrimonious legal case would cement the bad blood between father and son, when the courts sided with the younger Jane, things came to a head. In December 2012, Bob Jane was removed from Calder Park Raceway by security guards after the takeover of the circuit by his son, Rodney. Further court cases went back and forth, with Bob losing each time and further financial woes put him into bankruptcy. He continued to live on a plot of land at Digger's Rest, close to the circuit he masterminded for several years, until even this was sold a fork under him by the authorities to go towards an unpaid tax bill. Sadly, Bob Jane died on September 28, 2018, estranged from his son 
and then businesses he founded. In what was a very sad ending to proceedings, as of now, Calder Park is still open, but it has an uncertain future. After 1994, NASCAR never came back to Australia for other races. Not even the Euro Series hasn't haven't raced at Australia. To this day, the Thunderdome is still left abandoned with no future. Honestly, I feel like NASCAR racing at Australia is so forgettable. When I was doing my research, the race turned out to be a success. They wanted to have NASCAR races at the Thunderdome as a points paying race. Unfortunately, that did not go as planned. Although we did not see NASCAR race more in Australia and the Thunderdome, we can still look back at the historical moment and see that race being the first NASCAR race outside of the US. If there was some information that I had missed or got wrong, please feel free to respectfully tell me in the comments below. I always appreciate the help folks. Also, if you did attend that race, tell me how's it like. Also, that's going to do it for today's video. I want to give a shout out to my good friend NASCAR Nick 2488 once again for being featured in this video. Go subscribe to Nick's channel for more amazing content from his and follow his social accounts. Links are in the description below. So that's going to do it for this video and this episode. I want to say thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Ranking Stories. Comment, like, and subscribe for more content. Follow my social accounts. Don't forget to turn on my YouTube notification bell for more content and for more Racing Stories videos. Thank you guys so much for supporting E-Nation. This is the Impress 48 signing off. Good day, mate.